Thank you for joining today's webinar, Unlock the Power of Microsoft Intra ID Governance. We're just waiting for all attendees to arrive. We'll start the presentation in just a few moments. Welcome. Today's session is recorded and all attendees are muted. If you have questions during the webinar, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them for you. If you would like to reach out to the panel after the webinar, please visit agile.com backslash information dash security. I'm now going to turn the webinar over to our moderator, Dean Fantham. Welcome everyone to the webinar today where we're talking through and introducing an exciting new uh, uh, platform product set from Microsoft around the Entra Identity Governance Platform. Uh, we have a special guest from Microsoft joining us along with some folk from the Agile team. So maybe we'll let everyone introduce themselves and then we'll get going with the, with the format itself. So Irina. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. So, Irina Nichaeva, I'm a general manager of identity and network access at Microsoft. Perfect. And Randy? I'm Randy Weimer. I am a technical architect with Agile, and I do implementations of identity systems in the Microsoft Azure Entra ID system. Perfect. And I'm Dean Fantham. I'm a, a partner and a CTO of Agile. And maybe the, the format we're going to have today is um, we're going to do a, a kind of a, a, a quick Q&A chat with Irina around uh, uh, the thoughts behind Entra, the, the path, the journey to get here, to kind of set the scene for why we're, you know, for what, what, why we're having this uh, new platform. And then we're going to start our deep dive into, into the Microsoft Entra pla uh, set platform. So this will be the first of a series of webinars where we're going to deep dive into what Entra is, uh, what the capabilities are, and how you can start envisioning it solving some of your business problems. So, uh, so with that, um, what we'll do is, is maybe start into uh, some, some questions with you, Irina, right, and, and kind of, of get some of, this, some of this background here. So, you know, Agile has been involved with Microsoft and identity for a long, long time, ever since we found it, right? And obviously, we, and, and we've seen the evolution and journey, right? And there's been a lot of focus in recent years on the identity side, uh, on the uh, uh, authentication and access management side of this. And now we see this big push into the identity governance side. So you can tell us a little bit about the thinking, that progression, that journey, how you guys got to this point. Absolutely. And firstly, thank you so much for being uh, our partner. We so appreciate this partnership. Um, on Microsoft Entra progression, if you think about it in the context of Microsoft security portfolio, our mission and vision is to protect our customers comprehensively with the end-to-end -end solution. So if you think about it in that context, right, this progression makes a lot of sense. 
The role of Microsoft Entra in our security portfolio is to provide our customers with a complete solutions to secure any identity to any resource from anywhere. So then when any organization is looking for a solution to solve a problem of secure access, where they don't need to worry about mixing and matching different tools, they can just do it all with Microsoft Entra. So identity governance in that uh, sense was the most logical progression, right? Because between access management and identity governance, there's already a lot of overlapping capabilities. So it just makes sense to build them together. And for customers who already uh, standardized in our access management solution, Microsoft Enter ID, which is formerly known as Azure ID, it's also so simple to just turn it on and it's already integrated with applications with resources in their environment, right? So you just get much, much faster uh, time to value. And as you know, we don't start, stop at governance. We are adding many more new categories from verified ID to permissions management, including our most recent announcements in security service edge category. No, that's great. And so, uh, it, it, from the from the uh, the way you're describing it, the way it sounds, it's it's no it's it's not a capability we're adding on. This is a whole new platform, a whole new set of products that uh, that people were going to be able to you know come come to them be able to consume and use. So, is is that kind of a long term commitment to this this category of of solution? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Right, we are looking into, and I think you're seeing what we're seeing as well. Um, there's a lot of category convergence, category integration, because ultimately, I think both your company, our company, we're looking to help customers solve a particular scenario or a use case, right? And in this case, uh, we were on a mission to deliver a complete identity governance solution. So yeah, I would say it's a platform and a complete product line. Um, but what is important is the way that we built it is that underlying sort of uh, capabilities like identity store, the access policy, they're all unified, right? So that means you can just roll out new capabilities on top. You don't need to do integration work or have your identities um, stored in different places, right? And that's where that's the beauty of it. You have a converged solution but it is modular, right? You don't have to go all in. You can, again, pick the pieces that are most relevant to your business goals. Um, you can go at the pace that is the right pace for your organization and light up any new product within Microsoft Entra as your business needs evolve. Um, and now we also know that a lot of organizations, they are going to continue to live in that hybrid state for a long time. There's still a lot of use of our uh, on-premises solution, Microsoft Identity Manager or MEME. And so we made sure that uh, Entra Identity Governance works super well with MEME. And if you already build connectors for MEME, you can just now reuse it with Microsoft Entra ID Governance. Now that's good, that's great, that's perfect. And, um, I, you know, I, I know um, as we've gone through this cloud transformation, right, and obviously Microsoft right in the middle of that, driving a bunch of that for, our, you know, for a lot of organizations, um, identity governance was a lot of the traditional vendors have kind of taken on-premise and just kind of, you know, for one of a better phrase, shoved it in the cloud, right? right? <laughs> um, well, what's kind of the vision where you guys are going? Obviously, you know, we see this as being built, you know, for the cloud, on the cloud. Where, 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 where is there, and you've kind of asked a little bit of that, but where, where's the vision for where this is going? Uh, that's really a great point, right? That as we are going through that digital transformation, as organizations adopt multi-cloud architectures, they're cloud first. Um, a lot of those familiar solutions that we used on premises, they need to be reimagined because you need similar concepts, but they need to work in a very, very different environment. So the way we approached it was really building everything to secure and manage and govern from the cloud and making sure that it does scale to the multi-cloud environments and multi-cloud platform uh, architectures and to anywhere where the customer's environments are going to evolve. 
That said, I do want to reiterate, we know that on premises is not going away anytime soon. So as we're building to secure and govern from the cloud, we need to ensure that all of the resources that continue to stay on premises are equally protected, right? And then when you already have some of those uh, connectors or capabilities which you build for the on-premises systems, you can just easily fold them into that cloud delivered solution. Yeah, no, I, I think the, the point about hybrid and the fact that we're all moving to the cloud, but we have this long tail behind us of existing investments. Right. And that's, that's a really good point. Yeah. And, and maybe along the investment theme, like so identity access management typically is not a, we don't change these every year, right? When we make, <laughs> if I'm true. an investment, if I'm making investment decisions, yes. I have a long time frame, right? So what advice, I guess, you know, what do you guys see for helping organizations with that, you know, seven to 10 year investment horizon? Right? Uh, well, first, of course, uh, we're optimistic that many organizations would choose us as their strategic partner for identity transformation, identity and cloud modernization, um, and think through that strategic journey of how we partner with them to get their entire environment to that future proof state. I think when it comes to identity governance specifically, right, that's where it gets very interesting because of all identity categories, this one is probably the one that tends to seem like the most exclusionary or prohibitive, if you will, in terms of just like how long um, and how much investment organizations need to get it right. Yeah. Right, so there's this established belief that, oh, governance is only for those larger organizations that can dedicate resources to invest into that. And even how critical protecting identity and protecting every access point is in the modern environment, we were confident that we just need to democratize that. We cannot do a solution that's only um, sort of um, accessible to a select few. Right. Did you know that identity attacks, I mean, I think everybody knows identity attacks are on the rise, but in Microsoft ecosystem alone, in this year, we've seen over 4,000 password attacks per second, right? So we absolutely have to protect every organization. And that was a threefold increase from where it was two years ago. Um, and so what we've done is uh, we made it much, much easier to roll out. And again, like the broader solution, everything within identity governance is modular. So the way to think about it, right? Like you start with the quick wins. So for example, you can start with adopting machine learning driven access reviews and you get into a much stronger posture from the get go, right? Because you've already uh, kind of helped your um, broader organization eliminate a lot of the unnecessary access. And then you get into some of the more um, complex or more transformational capabilities. Yeah, that's it, it. You know, that rise in password attack alone, that metric is staggering, right? And yeah, and I think, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I, the other really uh, interesting point you made was about, you know, democratizing how we do this, right? How do we make it more accessible? Exactly. Uh, you know, what, we've, what we've seen as agile as we go through this is, you know, identity programs are hard, right? They're the hard things to accomplish. Exactly. And and they take time, and so I, I, I'm. I, but we also see the benefit in the platform where there's likely going to be benefits to doing this. And I don't know, you know, there's a lot of failure rates in identity programs that don't get to where they want to get to, mm. right? Uh, mm -hmm, don't get to success. Mm -hmm. So, all right, well, what's the, what's the what's the thinking behind the Entra platform and how maybe we can help lower the failure rate on identity programs? A hundred percent, right? That's where. I do believe organizations like Agile are just so, so critical as a partner on that transformational journey. And from what I've observed, the way to think about any type of transformational journey where identity governance is no different is getting very clear on what your business goals and priorities are, and then breaking down that transformational project into consumable, uh, chunks, right, or yeah. very clear milestones. 
And again, uh, a great way to think about identity governance, right? The different types of capabilities where we can, as we spoke earlier, right? You can start with access reviews right. and then move into the entire identity life cycle. But coming back to, right? Like that's where, again, we love the partnership we have with you because Agile is working with so many different organizations of different sizes, different industries. And so you are seeing what works and where the pitfalls are at such a massive scale. So that's where you can work with uh, organizations to really help them connect their business goals, right? That only they know to the technology that can enable those business goals. And that's where the magic happens. And then the other thing, which I think is really important, given the kind of history of how identity governance used to be run, um, right? Instead of like waterfall in the project for like five years where you don't get to test it until like year three, really think into what are the areas where you can get into the run state very quickly, get those quick wins and start learning and iterating. Because once you got there, then you're past that biggest hurdle where I think where you were talking about the failure, right? Like that's where most projects fail. They don't even get to like test it out until year two, three into the journey. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And Dan, thank you for the kind words. But yeah, we're, we're you know, we, we're big believers in if you can get to value quickly by really understanding business goals, what matters, Right, and we think there's a great alignment with what you know what you guys have built with the Entre platform there with it, and so I think that's going to uh, I think that fusion will be great. Right. I guess any any right. closing thoughts you have on this? I know we've taken a lot of your time kind of answering through this. So, uh, once again, very grateful to be here. I do hope that many organizations will try our solution because it's very easy to deploy because we do have amazing partners that can also help think for what's the easiest path to get to value. And I look forward to seeing more and more customers to be better protected. Yeah, we couldn't agree more. And, and thank you very much, Irina, for joining us today, giving your time, your insights uh, on, on this journey here. And, you know, we're very excited, very honored to be part of the part of the journey with you guys. Thank you. So with that, I think what we'll do is I'll introduce uh, well, we introduced Randy at the start of this, but get Randy to take over and begin the walkthrough of Entra itself. So as, as I introduced, this is going to be a multi-part series where we want to take uh, to take each of you kind of through the capabilities, which is where we'll, we'll focus today, and then we'll start deep diving into each area in some subsequent webinars. So you really can get a sense of the power and capability that is presented here on this platform. So with that, let me hand over to Randy and I'll let you begin walking through uh, the wonderful capabilities here. Thanks, Dean. So Microsoft had been a long time player in the identity access management, identity governance game with on-prem technology. Irina mentioned Microsoft Identity Manager, MIM, but it had a long history. You know, before it was MIM, it was FIM. Before it was FIM, it was ILM. Before it was ILM, it was MIIS. Before it was MIIS, it was MMS. But that line of development somewhat ended seven, eight years ago. 2015 is when MIM released. So what has Microsoft been doing since 2015? Well, they've been building a replacement for MIM as a native cloud service. So it's taken a long time by my standard, but they've hit that milestone this past summer. So they've now achieved that critical mass of capability where the cloud identity management, identity governance system solves the problem for just about any organization. It, it is a complete solution. So what I'm showing on the screen is the dashboard. So when you go to the Entra portal, one of the things you'll see under identity governance is a dashboard. And depending on your license level, the richness of the information available there, you know, depends on what sort of licensing your tenant has. Also under identity governance, you see a number of subsystems, entitlement management, access reviews, privileged identity management, lifecycle workflows. 
conspicuously missing in that category under identity governance is provisioning and deprovisioning. So that capability is certainly part of the overall solution. It's just not controlled or configured under the identity governance blade in the portal. So, you know, what is I enter ID governance? In my mind, it starts with provisioning and deprovisioning. How do we onboard new people, a, a joiner? And there are two aspects of a joiner. You know, there's the provisioning. How do I get them into the system, give them accounts in various places, give them birth rights? And then I've also got these lifecycle workflows that we'll get to, you know, which are the more customized things that I need to do. So just, you know, my, my goal today is simply kind of a, a survey of all the capabilities in the system. So it starts with provisioning and deprovisioning. And there's two flavors of that. There's inbound provisioning and outbound provisioning. Inbound provisioning, the, the fundamental use case is a new hire in a HR system like Workday or Success Factors or some other product. Just a, a digital record about a new hire appears in some data set somewhere. We wanna act on that data and begin the processing of information to support access to digital resources. So for the Workday and Success Factors scenarios, Enter ID has a built-in capability of importing data from Workday and Success Factors from the cloud to the cloud and acting on that data automatically. For organizations that don't use Workday or Success Factors, the same capability exists, but instead of just point and click and turning on a cloud service, it requires somebody to go put a little bit of scripted code into the environment to acquire the data from the source and apply it to a open standards endpoint in the Microsoft graph. But either way, I've got this capability of doing an inbound provisioning activity. The result of that can be as simple as a user object in the Azure Active Directory, the Enter ID. More commonly, the initial provisioning will be to an on-prem Active Directory. And the consequence of creating a new user in that Active Directory is typically AD Connect will make a copy of that user in the Enter ID directory in the cloud. So either of those flows is possible. If, if the organization has an Active Directory, then the process starts in the cloud, results in a user in the on-prem AD, and just as today, AD Connect synchronizes that user identity into the cloud directory. Okay, that's the inbound side. The outbound side is when certain data transactions arise in the Entra ID directory, by configuring things like I've added someone to a group or I've added someone, assigned them an application access, those kinds of transactions result in an outbound provisioning activity where a cloud service will make a open standards call to some other application repository and create, update, delete a user. Okay? And this is also where Irina talked about if you've built connectors for MIM, that same kind of process, that cloud provisioning, can trigger a transaction that reaches an on-prem agent that passes that transaction on to the classic MIM connector using the same interfaces that MIM has long used. And once that MIM connector receives the transaction, it does what it's always done. It can reach out via LDAP or via REST or via SOAP or via a PowerShell script and manipulate data in some application. So the simplest case of Enter ID provisioning, deprovisioning is all just configuration in the cloud on applications, point and click. Okay, but if those 
capabilities are inadequate, then we can go deeper and we can inject whatever custom integration is needed to manipulate that final target. Okay, so that's provisioning and deprovisioning. The second major category of Enter ID is entitlement management. Entitlement management introduces a couple of important concepts, a concept of an access package and a concept of a catalog. An access package is a collection of entitlements or resources or access or group memberships or team sites. All kinds of things can be treated as a resource inside of an access package. An access package offers a request approval process, and those can be simple or complex. I don't have to use a request approval process. I can do direct assignments of these access, access packages, and those can be manual. An access package owner can go to a portal and assign an access package to one or more users, and that's a manual direct assignment. But I can also use automatic direct assignment, where based on data about the user, I can award them one or more access packages. So it's, it's a wonderfully thought through approach that in a very real way is an improvement on the way in the past in which these kinds of activities took place. Built into that access package, I can define a periodic review. So it just becomes an inherent part of the definition of the package. I can run it monthly, quarterly, annually, or it could be an access package for which I don't need a periodic review. And one of the really good reasons why I might forego a periodic review is that I can define an access package to be time limited so that I can say, people awarded this access package, they will lose it in a year and they'll be notified and they can make a request to continue the use of that access package. So instead of burdening the manager every 90 days or every year, I can burden only the end user and only say I need it again if they in fact need it, okay? So we've reduced the number of mindless clicks on the approval processes by putting it closer to the person who is most interested in making the right decision, okay? And when they renew it, you know, if there's an approval associated with that access package, that approval will have to be done again, either the manager or resource owner or some combination. So I've got these access packages. I can put a single application or a single group into an access package, but by far the better model is put collections of resources into an access package. You know, in some sense, this is, this is a role concept. I think Microsoft has conspicuously not used the term role here because they're using role for some very specific purposes in other places in the, in the overall system. But an, I think of an access package very much like a role. It's a collection of entitlements with a standard process for the management of the life cycle. And the beauty of this is if a whole bunch of people in an organization all need the same collection of entitlements, then I can achieve it with a single request or a single assignment and a single review decision, which is much better than having to break it down. If there's 10 resources in there, having to discreetly say approved or denied on 10 separate things. Okay, so this access package idea is extraordinarily powerful. It's critical that they be curated very, very carefully. And the catalog idea is one of the means by which you're able to delegate to the right people the responsibility of curating their access packages. Okay, so the whole model, the whole system is designed to empower and delegate out control of things across the organization to the people where those things matter the most. So instead of purely being a back office IT responsibility, when done well, this can become the responsibility of people closer, more aligned with the business and what that resource actually is all about. 
another benefit of this catalog concept is it controls the visibility of access packages. So I can put a set of access packages into a catalog and only the people who are entitled to see and request things in that catalog will see these things in the request portal. Okay, so very powerful ideas. The next major category are access reviews. So if I've, if I've awarded people membership in groups or team sites or awarded them access to applications, and that awarding to applications is an important concept in the Enter ID system in the sense that an application is a full-fledged object in the directory. There's all kinds of things about applications that are encoded and recorded in the directory, including the ability to mandate that only people assigned to the application are ever going to be able to authenticate and receive a token to use the application. So an access review capability exists for anything that Entra is involved in out of the box, like cloud groups or team sites or applications or access packages. And these access reviews, they can be configured to run one time and we're done. They can be configured to be auto recurring. They can be a single reviewer decision like the user's manager, or they can be a combination of reviewers with the ability to have substitute reviewers should somebody's manager suddenly leave the organization. If the resource that's being reviewed is cloud native, then it's trivial to automatically remove access when the reviewer has denied continued access. But the whole system is entirely scriptable. So it, it's wrong to think of this as being only useful for cloud native resources. So we are doing projects, we are using the Azure Entra ID access review feature to review entitlements that are wholly outside of Azure and Entra ID. Because we can script the creation of these reviews, we can take any list of entitlements and via some very straightforward graph calls, we can instantiate that review in the directory, run the review, and when the review completes, a second script can take the results. And if the item that we are reviewing can be acted on programmatically, we can reach into that system and revoke access. When we face scenarios where there is no programmatic method of manipulating data in that application, then the typical pattern is we open a service desk ticket and say, remove access for this user for this application. So the access review, the, the screenshot I'm showing here is what, what does a manager see or a reviewer see? You know, they see a list of the people that they are reviewing access for a given resource and they can reprove or eject everybody at once or individually. So it's, it's a very streamlined user experience. Privileged identity management. So many organizations have had P2 licenses for some time and have been using privileged identity management to control the Azure Active Directory, Enter ID roles. And there's a hundred plus roles in the solution at this point, and it continues to grow. And they can also use this cloud-based privileged identity management to manage the permissions for Azure resources, okay? What is changing now is the ability to take any security group and apply the PIM just-in-time, just-enough elevation workflows to an arbitrary group. And that allows us to extend not just for the Microsoft native resources, 
But to extend this concept of just-in-time and time-bound elevation to things beyond Entra and Azure, okay? So the concept is, you know, we're going to make people define them to configure them to be eligible to elevate. And we can require an approval when they do elevate, or it can just simply be a self-service model with, with no third-party intervention. And we can say, you've got a multi-factor before you can activate your role. And we can include a justification when you activate. We can send notifications out. We can do access reviews on the set of people who are activating. And we've got a full-blown record of everybody who is elevated, what their justification was. This is quite different than the PAM products that many companies deploy where the strategy is password vaulting. The reality is password vaulting is wonderful, but it's not sufficient because the attacker doesn't necessarily need the password to compromise the system. The idea in this model is only elevate and make those permissions active at the moment they're needed and then take them away. So it's, it's a quite a different model than the password vaulting that many products employ. And I would submit most organizations actually need both of these capabilities. So this is a screenshot of kind of what the management interface looks like. So I've got a user named Manager2, and they have three different Azure AD roles that they are eligible to activate, okay? One of them, the attack payload author, is time limited. It will go away, and this person will lose the ability to elevate and use those permissions at the end of that interval. The other two are, as you see in end time, they're permanent. So that person is able to, the manager too, is able to elevate and become an authentication administrator but the idea is they only elevate and use that permission for a limited period of time and then it goes away. And finally, this is the, the piece of the solution that is most recent and in a sense, most interesting. So it enables full-blown joiner, mover, lever workflows. So what do I want to have happen when a new user, whether they're a contractor or a user, or a service, or you know, an admin account on behalf of some specific employee, what do I want to have happen when they join the organization? What do I want to have happen when the state of their data changes? What do I want to have happen when they leave the organization? And in identity projects that Agile have been doing for years. What different organizations, there's some common things that every organization expects to see happen. And many of those are out of the box. We just have to go configure the built-in task that Microsoft has put into the solution. But more often, or in all cases, we see organizations that have very unique things and practices in their network. And we have to customize these processes to a great degree. So we've got this built-in point and click for the common tasks. Hey, you know, send the, the activate the account, you know, and send the one-time passcode, the tap to the manager on the start date, or add them to these groups as birthright, or when someone leaves, disable and leave the account lingering for a while and take them out of these highly permissioned roles or access packages and chase down all of their associated admin accounts and disable them. You know, those are kind of the scenarios that this, these workflows are, are purpose-built to do. And if I can achieve the result with a point and click, we're good. If Microsoft hasn't pre-built a, a task in the system, then I can extend it with a Logic App. And Logic App is a low-code, no-code, Azure service 
to build much more complex workflows. Okay, things like open a ticket and service now. I, I can do that with a logic app. If what I need to accomplish, I cannot even achieve with a logic app with no code, low code, then I can always configure my logic app to call some rest endpoint. And it can be an Azure function. It could be a Lambda in AWS. It could be a, a web service that you've already got on your network, okay? I can, I can arrange for the logic app to call a function, a rest endpoint somewhere, meaning I can do anything that someone can code. And so this is an example of the management interface for a joiner workflow. And I'm looking at the task panel and I've got some built-in tasks, enable the user accounts, send the welcome email, add the user to groups. So a lot of a lot of good things can be accomplished by administrators who don't have to develop deep skills in this technology stack. So Dean, I hope that was interesting. We we've touched on the major subsystems within Enter ID governance, and you know, in follow-on webinars, we'll go much much deeper in how do we configure these things and, and what are the use cases they can solve? Thanks very much, Randy. I really uh, appreciate the overview going through there and hopefully what everyone can appreciate is uh, you know, the, 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 the amount of power and, and optionality that's been built into this platform. You know, identity management and, and, and the, you know, the processes that we try and enable and, and, and put customers into, you know, they have all sorts of flavors, right? And so, uh, you know, having a you know this a, this powerful platform, these these things we can manipulate, the clay we can mold, as it were, right, to help solve these problems. I think is going to be fascinating, and hopefully, uh, is it in subsequent ones? Everyone here, you know, if you can uh, join this, the follow-on uh, the follow-on webinars, we'll get to go through these in in more detail. Uh, a lot of power, a lot of embedded stuff in here. So, thank you for that, and just to thank you again, Irina, for your your time and and participation here. Um, and to all of you that joined us on the webinar, um, hopefully it's it's of value to you guys and and to you all. And we will will be uh, sending out notifications for uh, for the next webinar. It's a set of webinars coming up. Um, and here's uh, you know some contact information as well if you want to reach out and get some more information here. So with that, we'll we can we can end and close here. And thanks everyone for, for participating and 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 joining. And we will speak soon.